come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> Hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast, the movie and talk show podcast that comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not, in our quest for total world domination, which you, yes, you, listener, right now are helping us out with. So thank you very much for playing along. These are the Internet Radio Superstars. Michaela, Holly. And I'm Colin. And tonight we watched the movie that was chosen by Holly. What did we watch tonight? Tonight we watched a movie called Messiah of Evil. Ooh, Ooh from the year uh, 1974. Okay. Okay. Some say 73, 74. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And directed by? Directed, <laughs> written and directed by Will. Oh, I totally forgot. I don't know how to pronounce this guy's last name. I think it's Hyuk. Hyuk. But that sounds that yeah. sounds fake. Hyuk? Yeah, d- Hyuk. 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 <laughs> yeah, we should probably it's know this. Willard Hy- Hyuk. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know how to say it. <laughs> I like Hyuk. I like that. I like Hyuk. 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 Yeah. Hyuk. Hyuk. <laughs> yeah. So, well. Oh yeah. So I guess so, that is what kind of makes this movie notable. Intre- yeah, interesting. Uh, of note. Yeah. This is the name that, well, well, we're not familiar how to say it apparently, but we're familiar with this name, (laughs) especially on this show, because notoriously, uh, we hate one of his movies. I was going to say Sean brought one of his movies, didn't he? Sean brought one of his movies. The movie in question is Howard the Duck. I knew it. Yep. I was like, (laughs) I'm I'm triggered by this name for a reason why. Yes. Uh, He wrote and directed Howard the Duck. Um, I don't know why he yeah. did that, yeah. but um, Howard the Duck. Like everybody, does everybody know Howard the Duck? Everyone knows Howard. Go the listen Duck. to our whether episode whether on it. they've actually watched the actual movie or not yeah. Yeah. is the question. Yeah. But everyone knows what Howard the Duck is because mm-hmm. the Marvel they brought him back, Marvel character back in think, Guardians of the Galaxy. Yeah, yeah. but. I, yeah, I mean, that's how the current generation found yeah. out about it. But, I mean, other than that, like, everyone knew who it was. Just yeah, we had the movie. We had the yeah. movie. Big budget Lucasfilm yes. movie yeah. that we did an episode on. Yeah. yeah. We sure Oof. did. Yeah. <laughs> I fucking hate that I movie. I hate that movie <laughs> so much. Sean made us watch that while we were in quarantine, too, so our mental state was already <laughs> fragile, but, and we had to watch yeah. that. It, it, I, 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 <laughs> Hoyk? Hook? Yeah. Hayek? <laughs> Hayek? Let's go. With, uh, yeah. Hayek. I don't Hayek? know. This is going to be a thing. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, this dude has this dude has a thing with making movies that are well known that I feel guilty about hating. Really? Well, yeah. Okay. I hate Howard the Duck. Okay. I fucking hate that movie. I don't feel guilty about that. Yeah. You're saying but, as a director because yeah. he's also notable as a screenwriter. Yes, but he is. But as a director. Yes, he is. And because I hate American Graffiti. Oh. Really? He, oh. he wrote that movie. I mm-hmm. think it is the most boring ass movie. Wait, did he write it by himself though? Yeah. Uh he he wrote the screenplay. Is it, wasn't but, it with his wife, Gloria Katz? Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Glo- I'm sorry. We should have talked about that. Gloria Katz is uh his wife mm-hmm. and also co- co-writer, co-director, yeah. co-producer. I guess cuz that's I always knew them as like a screenwriting yes, duo. Yes, she they're a team. They do everything together. But um I don't like American Graffiti. Mm-hmm. I think that movie's so boring. Oh wow! Uh, yeah, I know, I know, I know. It's a classic. <laughs> I think I've seen it like exactly once, so I kind of get where you're coming. I know from, it's yeah. a classic. I know there's amazing stars in it, mm-hmm. and there's some great cars. There's some great costumes. There the are music. good points about it. Yeah, yeah, music is amazing. I'll listen to the soundtrack all day long, mm-hmm. but it is a boring ass movie. Mm-hmm. I. It is. An ode to the cruising subculture of it's the 1950s. A, but they, it's a nostalgia movie for not our generation. It's yeah. you know. for my dad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My yeah. dad loves that movie. Because it, it came out in the 70s and it was looking back 20 yeah. years. Yeah. Ago. Remember say, when we were kids and it was that awesome? Is, that is my dad's dazed and confused. Okay. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, but also he wrote my least favorite Indiana Jones movie. What? what? He wrote an Indiana Jones movie? Temple of Doom. Oh. Okay. Well, that is not, no, no longer is that my least favorite. Yeah. Oh, that's Indiana true. Jones. Dial of Destiny. <laughs> that's, <laughs> no. Honestly, no. Dial of Kingdom Destiny. Of Crystal, yeah. Crystal yeah. Skull, yeah. Crystal Skull is the yeah. worst one. Yeah. I always forget to like count that. Yeah. Because to me, it like doesn't exist. I actually didn't hate Dial of Destiny. Yeah. I didn't see it. It wasn't offensively bad. Mm-hmm. Not great, but not offensively bad. But yeah, no. So this guy makes movies that I feel like 
I should be ashamed to admit that I don't like them. <laughs> but still, I mean, that's like, uh, you know, like he's a major player that if he he's is. written, you know, I mean, an Indiana Jones movie, yes. you know, is, is, and uh, American Graffiti. So mm -hmm. he knew George Lucas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, did you hear uh, that he also, him and his wife did script doctoring on Star Wars? They did. Nice. And did you hear what? They their contributions were no, I didn't. What is this? Uh, well, according to Internet Legend, they um, I think I found it on Gloria Katz's bio, but they contributed to the development of, of Princess Leia's character in oh. uh, on script doctoring on Star Wars. Excellent oh. contribution. Okay, then yeah. that's Love redeeming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's yeah. very redeeming. They gave her some humor. I guess Good. that was Gloria Katz or whatever. It uh, worked out well. Yeah, yeah. I'm glad. So, she needed it. Mm -hmm. So they were in the, yeah, because I remember like they, you know, their names kept popping up in association with uh, Lucasfilm um, mm -hmm. projects. Yeah. This predates all of that, right? Predates American Graffiti and all of that. It does. So I assume they were students. Was it UCLA? Mm -hmm. That everybody like, that was the film school. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was when. That was like the first like film school. You went to school to figure out how to make movies. Yeah. And this was like the first generation yeah. that you did You go to UCLA. It. If you yeah. watch Dawson's Creek, that is Dawson's <sighs> entire storyline for the whole run of the series is that he wants to go to UCLA because Spielberg went there yeah. and wants to learn to be the next Steven Spielberg. Spoiler, yeah. he drops out real quick. Yeah, <laughs> Like the first semester, yeah. Yeah. Because he can't hack it. <laughs> but this is 1973 or whatever, 72, 73. It, it was, was shot. Yeah, it was shot in 71. Shot in 71. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a horror movie. It is a horror movie. It is a zombie movie. Okay. Um, is it? Is that where where it gets filed? Is like yes. There's a very heavy like Night of the Living Dead. Yes. Um, sense to the like inspiration. It was released under multiple titles. Okay. Oh. Um, besides Messiah of Evil, it was also Dead People, <laughs> Night of the Damned, Return of the Living Dead, and Revenge of the Screaming Dead. Oh, okay. those are all way worse. Yeah. Messiah of Evil is a great title. It is a good title. It is a yeah. good title. It's a really good title. Is it true? No. No, <laughs> it's not. It could have been. Messiah of Evil makes you think uh, Satan is going to come back. Or like a satanic yeah. cult's going to revive something, or there's going to be some yeah. sort of reckoning. They <laughs> they allude to the possibility of a messiah of evil in okay. the lore that they depict in this movie. Okay, does it deliver? Mm, we'll get there. Well, yeah. this <laughs> movie um, has kind of existed. Uh, like, I mean, I guess uh, I'm trying to think how far back my awareness of it goes. Right, mm -hmm. like. I am not even sure because I worked at a video store in the 90s and we had a extensive horror film collection. Mm -hmm. And you I were Randy. Don't recall. Yes. yes. <laughs> and I don't recall this one. It's like I became aware of it later once uh, we started kind of restoring movies. And then there was like we just were going back and restoring everything, mm -hmm. finding all of these things from the past. And then it seemed like this kind of appreciation begins for Messiah of Evil that continues to this day, because I think recently I saw there was a screening maybe yes. in Chicago. I think so. And Wait, then, yeah. like, I, I keep getting uh, ads for the Night Flight. Uh, night yeah. Flight from the 80s is returned mm -hmm. as an app, and they're like, we and we have Messiah of Evil. Yeah, I, <laughs> I don't... <laughs> it's so funny, because... You, know, you were talking about how it just all of a sudden ads start showing up for you. The same thing happened for me. Like as soon as I announced that this was my next pick, Facebook was like, I got you. <laughs> and all over my Facebook, I'm seeing all of these posts about this movie mm -hmm. and I'm reading the comments and all these people are like, it's the scariest movie I've ever seen. It's a cult classic. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what the, where did this mm -hmm. come from? Like, like Colin and I went through this when Elvira did her, her special, um, her 40th anniversary special a few years ago where she did city of the dead also previous episode and yeah. uh like two other movies and yeah the like fandom around this movie really showed up on the internet when yeah. elvira really covered do. it yeah, yeah. so there's definitely a cult following mm -hmm. for this movie for sure well i wonder um because there's several other movies f that have a similar it's like a tone or a yeah. sense about them how do you describe like it's it's like an independent film mm -hmm. 
feels like it's maybe made by film students, mm-hmm. right? You, you, there's a, a universe where like Halloween comes out of the same kind of, hey, we're going to make a movie yeah. um, sense that this one comes out of, it right? It has that like first movie vibe for sure. Yeah. 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 Um, less successful than Halloween, but mm-hmm. I mean, still remembered to this day. So, I mean, I suppose that is a, an accomplishment, mm-hmm. um, but it has this kind of, all right, I'm going to say it's a movie made by hippies. Yeah. Is that true or false? Is I, that the sense you get from a lot of the movies that, uh, have you, have you guys seen, uh, let's scared Jessica to death? No, that's been on my list of bring this. We've show talked while, about though. it. Yeah. I have never actually watched yeah. it, but we have talked about that movie. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How about the witch who came from the sea? Yes. Previous episode. Yes. I, you were not here for that one. Or, or, were you? Thank, no, no, thankfully I yeah, was not. You would not have liked that one. <laughs> but is there a shared vibe there? Yeah. Am I off? This like seventies kind of like lo-fi art but like artsy kind of hippie yeah. vibe to it i get what you're saying were yeah. you here for lamora the child's tale of the supernatural i'm just no, throwing some not. like these are they're like low budget do you remember that one i think i was here for that one similar vibe or yeah no? okay yeah so that's the era that we're talking about right it's like these filmmakers are making these one-offs a lot of them do seem to have some kind of uh there's a lot of uh, like indebtedness to it feels like Night of the Living yeah. Dead. Yeah. Yeah. It's Absolutely. it's an art house horror from the 70s. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But they all yeah. go with the same thing. It's like they there's do. ghouls yeah. that might be vampires. Right. No, that's that legit. might be Satanists. <laughs> they might be zombies. Yeah. We never. You the, can't shoot them and kill them. We know that. And the rules are never clearly defined. I think that's what all these movies kind of right. have is that yeah. we're not really defining what our antagonist is, but like you yeah. can read it as one of those and i i'm okay with that because i think it adds to the horror that there that there is no answer there's no reasoning there's no like there's no lore to like explain what's happening Mm -hmm. it's just happening and i think that makes it scary okay although they there is lore in this movie that we're gonna get there's lore but not about what the creatures are yeah okay yeah yeah or maybe what created them Mm -hmm. but not specific uh rules on what they are so right um the setting is a big part of this movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, where does it take place? At a beach house. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay, I was going with the larger, like, but you're right. Most yes. of the movie does take place. A small town. Okay, and it's called Point Dune. Point Dune. Now, specifically. Which is named after a California town. Okay. Do you know where it was actually filmed? Uh, ooh, that's a good If question. you were going to go try and check this place out. <laughs> yeah, if you like... want to see um, the I, filming I, locations I, of yeah. I feel like it's named after the town that it was filmed in. Like, it's a small town. It's something very similar to that. Okay. Uh, Dune, that's D U N E, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sand Dunes. Um, we are told early on that it was originally named Bethlehem mm-hmm. and it was renamed as Point Dune because of a hundred year old. Uh, story, superstition yeah. or story yeah. that involves a blood moon. Blood moon, sure. And the return of a dark stranger. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. obviously. Okay. Small town lore. Everyone has that, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, right? I mean, yeah. we got Blood's Point. Yeah. Blood's okay. Point. We don't have a blood moon. We have Blood's <laughs> Point. Yeah. 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 Um, There's a stranger, though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's going to be. Because I, I thought, you know, as we got into this, it was like some of it felt like um, Mormonism or something. The idea of what was the guy's name who started, founded Joseph uh, Smith. Joseph Smith. Yeah. yeah right. Mm-hmm. Like coming out of the desert and this uh, guy mm-hmm. comes out of the sea and mm-hmm. like all that. Um, so how does uh, the movie get going? I think we had like a cold open that kind of just dropped mm-hmm. us into the horror. <laughs> yeah, there is a cold open. It's just. Uh, um, there's a man running down a sidewalk, mm-hmm. right? That was yeah. the cold open. Yep, to yeah. a '70s pool, which is a dope ass yeah. pool. Yeah, yeah. And then a lady comes out from the shadows by the pool, but and she looks like maybe a little girl, yeah. but maybe a woman. You can't really tell. And she slashes his throat. Yep, and cold open done. Yeah. So I don't know what we get out of it. it. It's no. like <laughs> he's know. running from something. What's he running from? Yep. Right. Mm-hmm. He's terrified. He's hot and sweaty. He has mm-hmm. to, you know, get some water on him. Then he lays down. She comes over and we're like, well, what is she like going to tend to him? Is right. he, you know, 
but then she slashes his throat in mm-hmm. some kind of unmotivated uh, murder. Mm-hmm. The guy who uh, is in this, mm-hmm. uh, this is uh, significant. Oh, in this scene, yes. Yeah. Yes. The, the stabbing victim is Walter Hill. You may know as the director and writer of 48 Hours, Brewster's Millions, The Warriors. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Streets of the Fire. Streets, Streets of Fire. Of fire. Yes. Yep. Well, that would mean that uh, thanks wall. to MF Mad, the keeper of the Saturday Night Free Show Wall of Fame, he wants us to know that, yes, Walter Hill, because Messiah of Evil, The Warriors, and Streets of Fire has made it to the Saturday Night Free Show. I'm sad I wasn't here for Streets of Fire. That, uh, that, oh, man, what a movie. What a picture. What a picture. Is, is a yeah. <laughs> yeah. What a picture. Yeah. yeah, another one of those uh, yeah. nostalgic look back on the 50s. Yeah, only in but the, with Willem Dafoe. So, yeah, Michael yeah. Perret yeah. and a lot of rock and roll. Yep. Um, we did Dafoe that one. Yeah. Treasure. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, he's also the producer of uh, the Alien, Alien yes. movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so Which is significant for uh, a very important line in this movie. Really? What? Mm-hmm. Um they say it how many they say it how many times? They say it the beginning and the end. Hmm. <coughs> Pardon me, which line? What was the exact wording? Because it's it's alien but not alien. <laughs> oh. Yeah, that was his contribution to the alien script. When he like rewrote Dan O'Bannon's. <laughs> oh yeah, no. In this, it's just no one will hear you scream. Oh, and that became yeah. the tagline for yeah. Alien. Oh, uh, okay, okay. In okay. space, no one will hear you mm-hmm. scream. Really? Yeah. Okay. Well, mm-hmm. there you go. See, that's yeah. why you listen mm-hmm. to the Saturday Night Freak Show. You find out yeah. where your favorite taglines. We hear it came in the from. beginning, and then we hear it multiple times at the end of the movie. So. <clears throat> right. Yeah. So introduced to the movie proper, well, how do we get into the cursed uh, town of Point Dune? The arrival of what was her name? <laughs> that lady drives. Arletty. Arletty. Yeah. Okay. Drives up to a gas station. Yeah. <laughs> and we recognized her here on the Saturday Night mm-hmm. Freak Show as an alumni because she was in, it's uh what's the actress's name Mariana, Mariana Hill. Mariana Hill. Mm-hmm. Who was also in uh, Godfather Part Two. Well, we didn't cover the Godfather part. Oh, two. well, we did, what did we cover? She was one of the Corleones, I think, in the she Godfather. She was, yeah. She was Burt Reynolds' girlfriend in... No, was she? No, maybe that was the other... She was in The Baby. No. Oh, yes. that's right. I See, I, I'm still trying <laughs> to block <laughs> it out. Even though we talked about it while watching this, yeah. I'm still trying to block the it out. The notorious uh, The Baby. Yeah, yeah. Note that I didn't note it in my yeah. notes. Yes. What trying happens in The out. Baby's Room? Oh, God. <laughs> Nothing. The baby. I have never Nothing seen that you anything need to like witness. that. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing I... happens in that room or movie that you need to witness. <laughs> yeah. Um, so she's in this movie. She's the star, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so she arrives at a gas station and mm-hmm. strange shit is already going down. Yeah. The gas station attendants just shooting into the darkness outside <laughs> this gas station, which if I saw this... I can wait till the next gas station. I'm yeah. moving along, especially because it seems like it's one of those places you can't pump yourself. Yeah, it's, so, all, uh, yeah. it's a full service yeah. back in the 70s. I was like, back then, was were there any places you could pump yourself? No. I don't think no. there was. Yeah. 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 So he's shooting at... Uh, and I he like says that, wild dogs. And I like that it's like a full-fledged mobile. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's branded, it's a mobile gas it's a station. full-fledged mobile. Mm-hmm. And then... Uh, things get weirder because an albino trucker shows up. Correct. Yes. And in the, the gas station attendant discovers that in the back of his flatbed are bodies. With their throat slit. And I think their yeah, eyes, their eyes, eyes like, are missing. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so then he becomes the target and eventual victim of the albino, I assume. Mm-hmm. I don't know yeah. who killed him, but he dies in right. a, a stalk and slash mm-hmm. sequence yeah. in the... But he's like not panicking. Right. Right? He's just like, yeah, I'm still going to pump your gas. Like he's not nervous that he's just discovered these dead bodies in the back. Of well, he truck. tells her, he's like, get out of here. Go, you know, tells her to yeah. split once he notices the bodies. So. So we've had a couple of scenes now just like launching us into this where we don't understand the motive. There's a danger. There are people who are killing other people. Uh, motive unknown. Um, she's coming into this. Why? Because she's going to Point Dune or and whatever, and the gas station attendant. Of course, it's one of those things where it's like nobody goes to Point Dune. Is it Point? Am I saying that right? I think so. Yeah. Or, yeah, Pleasant point. Dune. It was Point Dune. Point Dune. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's on the sea. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so why is she traveling to this location? Uh, she's looking for her father, who is apparently missing. And what do we know about her father? All we know is that he's an artist. A Seemingly painter. an eccentric artist. Yeah. yeah. But well known. Well known, Because yeah. they know him at the art gallery. Yes. Even though there's weird reality things going on here, she says that she, you know, the, the or I think the, the owners of the art gallery, one of whom's blind at the, the painting. <laughs> blind painting and mute. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but blind and mute art dealer. Art okay, dealer, it's important. Yeah. Art dealer. So I this just, person is supposed to know taste and curate it. And recommend it to other people. And what I want to point out that this is clearly a commentary on the art world that I don't entirely disagree with. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Being an artist myself, and Michaela can agree. Yeah, like there's some bullshit people in yeah, charge. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, I love that this scene, like this lady, has such a short appearance in this part of the movie. But they take so many slams at her in this one scene because, first of all, there's the blind and mute part, but then she feels. Our Letty's face, yeah, and Our Letty says in like the narration, her hands felt my space like a face like a pale spider, and I'm like, damn, you all are just going in on her. Like, <laughs> I mean, she does seem to suck, but yeah, she like does. wow, unnecessary commentary. I feel like I, I like the uh, I like the the turn of phrase in this movie. Yeah, I like the wording. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot of it is delivered by voiceover. Right. It is. A yeah. lot of it is delivered is by weird. voiceover. So it's very like noir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. The <laughs> well, I don't disagree with that because yeah, I mean it, mm-hmm. it does the okay, so the I guess this is the elephant in the room about this movie that I have a question about. Oh. Did it seem to you, because this is how it played to me, okay, that a lot of scenes were filmed silent. Right. Just to get something. And they were from a different like idea or thing that we had shot then as filmmakers. And then we edited it all together and we used extensive use of voiceover to cover it over, make it seem like it all fit as part of the same movie. Yeah. And we also, when we don't know how to transition from one scene to another, just put in a shot of the waves crashing on the beach. Yeah. Good God. With extensive voiceover to cover it. Oh my God. So many. And I think it's the same shot most of the time of the waves crashing on the beach. I think a lot of the voiceover is a a vehicle for that. But Mm -hmm. I think some of it is intentional because a lot of the scenes are reading her father's diary. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of the voiceover is intentional. But not all of it. I think some of it is a is a tool, like yeah, you're saying. I think those are the two main narrations that we get. Yeah. We get her narration of the present day events, and then we mm-hmm. get his narration as she reads through these diaries and it echoes through her head of what happened in the town leading up to the moment that she got mm-hmm. there. But it did, I guess, I don't know. I, I'm curious to know like how much of this was actually scripted when they went into it. Yeah. And then, you know, it took years and they filmed this and that and the mm-hmm. other thing. And then they couldn't figure out how to fit it all together and then made it all up in the editing room. I don't mm-hmm. know. I mean, in and some you know, ways it felt like that. Mm-hmm. But then there were yeah. other scenes and long stretches where it was like, well, clearly they intended for all of this stuff to link together. Yeah. And, you know, you know that the dad's um, voiceover was intentional just because of who they chose for the voice of um, uh, Joseph Lang. Yeah, her dad. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Royal Dano. Yeah. Was Joseph Lang. Uh, if you don't know, Royal um, jo- uh, Royal Dano was the voice of Lincoln at the Hall of Presidents. In nice. <laughs> yeah. A longtime cowboy yeah. actor. Oh, yeah. He's been in tons of stuff, but he is the voice of Lincoln. Well, we've seen him on this show. Is he on the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame? Let me uh, is he? consult. <gasps> I think he already is. Yeah. I, I know we did. Um, did we do Ghoulies 2? He's in Ghoulies 2. You have to ask uh, Sean about in, that one. Uh, Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Oh, yeah. He is in that. So. Um, he's been in so many things, but the one that I always kind of respected Royal Dano for was because he was an old guy in 1987 or 88 when he played Gramps in House 2, uh-huh. the second story, in full body makeup, you know? I mean, I had to be, I think his last role was in the dark half. He was like yeah. a grave digger or something in the dark half. But Pretty tedious roles for someone that... To be right. that much, yeah. like, right. full, you know, prosthetics as one of the main yeah. you know, characters in, in House 2. It's not a good movie, but, no. you know... 
great title though. House two, the second story. Yeah. Oh my god, that's yeah. genius. I love it. it <laughs> love that. Yeah. That was pretty yeah. good. Yeah. But he plays her dad. Like he he's actually in the movie. Eventually yes. he does show yeah. up, but uh narrates quite a bit of it. Um so Okay. So yeah, I guess there's there's what there's what yeah. happened in the past, which we hear once she actually finds his uh stuff but then there's other characters that we meet in mm-hmm. the present day which right, way so, do you want to go first right so at the gallery she asks you know my my dad is a painter he's joseph lang i i'm just wondering if you know him and they're very snotty about it they're very much like oh yeah just because we're a gallery we should know every artist and she's like well this I mean- is why okay this is why certain artist types suck right here. Perfect example of like a gatekeeping asshole for no reason. I agree. And then he goes on to say, but of course we've heard of him. He's in magazines we can read. And it's like, you just gave her shit right. that she thinks you know him. And now you're saying you do know who he is. Yeah. And it's just stupid. But, and then he says, um, oh, by the way, there was other people in here earlier looking for him. And it's like, you know what, you son of a bitch. Just answer my fucking question like, the first time, you know? Like, don't give me shit for asking, and mm-hmm. then you give me shit because you do know, and then you give me more shit because I'm not the only one looking for right. him. Like, everything about this guy, I wanted to punch him in his mm-hmm. weaselly face. It mm-hmm. just made me really mad. But also, yeah, it's a horrible, accurate look into the world of art. <laughs> <laughs> well, he leads you take them your, to... Uh, you take your lighthouse paintings and shove it. Yeah. Well, that's where I was saying there was some maybe reality shifting things later because the people that she meets who are looking for her dad say that, oh, yeah, there was a painting of his in that gallery, Mm -hmm. but they said it wasn't for sale. And she's like, but there were no paintings of my dad there. Mm -hmm. And we're like, well, who do we believe at this point? Like the whole thing is kind of the narrative is who do you trust? What's real? What isn't? Mm -hmm. Is the whole thing a nightmare? Mm -hmm. If so, who's having it? Maybe we'll answer those questions. Mm -hmm. So. Anyway, she has led to three visitors, vacationers, travelers to the town who are also here. And this is uh, some guy named Tom. He's Mm -hmm. a well-dressed fellow, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And his two female companions, whose names I have escaped me. No idea. (laughs) Tony and Laura. Tony and Laura. Mm -hmm. I do did look up. uh, I looked up some uh, trivia about the about Michael Greer. No, but tell me oh. if that's Tom. Okay. Michael Greer played Tom. Um, he is an important figure because he was one of the first openly gay actors in Hollywood. Oh, cool. Love that. Mm-hmm. Um, and he played uh, a gay landlord in the movie The Gay Deceivers from 1969. Nice. I don't know if you know this one. I've actually seen this movie. It's two dudes are pretending to be gay so that they can dodge the army. Uh, oh, I love it. But, they're, it. but their the landlord is actually gay. Like, oh, it's, my God. Yeah. Oh, I'm God. Who is in that? I didn't it even write like it down. A, well, yeah. I didn't even write it down, but it's a it's a funny movie. But um, yeah. So that's Tom Michael Greer and Anita. Uh, Anita Ford. Anita Ford. Yeah. Who plays the Laura. one of his Laura? She was one of the first uh, models on The Price Is Right. Yes, she huh. was. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> and she had a pretty extensive career on The Price Is Right. <laughs> yeah, and some movies. She was in yeah. The Big Bird Cage. Yeah, I think was one of them. So. Do you think? Being a Price is Right model pays well. No. No? <laughs> Do you think you at least get, like, uh, the showcase showdown that loses or something? Or, like, the, <laughs> the prize, like, the blenders people can't, you know, win in the fucking knockout game or something, you know? I would hope I that they're... A discount on Maytag appliances? I mean, I don't think in the 70s they were paid very well, but yeah. I, I would like to think that they're paid decent now. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, as know? the show becomes more popular, right. I'm sure their contracts right. get, yeah. go up I every time. I could watch Price is Right forever. Dude, it never gets old. <laughs> I love that show. Never. <laughs> Well, um, so these three folks are, well, yeah, and then the third girl is, um, like, she's constantly referred to as, like, a child. She's the younger one. Yeah. We're assuming, I don't know, I kind of got, like, hippie vibes. They have, they're, like, they have nowhere to go and nothing to do, right? I think Tom is, uh, he says his family was aristocrats or whatever. He has mm-hmm. money. Mm-hmm. And so the two yeah. girls are just kind of kicking around with him, and they're yeah. just bumming around Southern California. Uh, we assume they're all having sex with each other I mean, at I'm some point. I'm not going to lie. It sounds kind of awesome. 
Well, <laughs> but it doesn't make for the most interesting movie because it's just them laying around a lot. And well, just like feels like they're true. waiting for something to happen, and I'm waiting for something. They to are waiting for the something viewer. to happen. Yes, <laughs> because we're told that Tom is a collector of mythology or something yeah. like that, or of mm-hmm. stories, and so he's yeah. basically come to Point Dune because he's heard the story of the Blood Moon mm-hmm. and the return of the Dark Stranger, and so he just kind of wants to soak up the atmosphere. Um, and so to do that. He is when we first meet them, it's all very strange it's in a hotel strange, room with yeah. Elijah Cook Jr., uh, <laughs> who we are inducting to the Saturday Night Freak all Show right. Wall of Fame. So there you go. You didn't know there was going to be two. Mm-hmm. But Elijah Cook Jr., uh, he was in the Haunted Palace oh. that we did. And he was in Blackula and a Messiah of Evil. All right. Cool. You would know this guy if you've seen like seventies. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, he has a very familiar face. Yeah, yeah, he's the guy, the disembodied head, right at the beginning of the House on Haunted yes. Hill that he yes. comes out, and yeah, all those uh, great William Castle mm-hmm. movies and Roger Corman <laughs> stuff. All Elijah Cook Jr. Um, so, he, but he's like feel, the town a, drunk. Every, I feel like everyone in this movie has like a little bit of a story to him. Even, yeah. even the gas station attendant was in Butch Cassidy and uh, and That's the Sting. Awesome. Yeah, so it's not yeah. like they're you know. I mean, I guess. It, I, it's like how do you explain like this what this movie feels like is like these are you know i guess film students who because you're in the the you're in california like mm-hmm. you're getting all these actors just kind of on their off day mm-hmm. to come over and do something and not like they're famous or anything but like they have a body of work i mean they're mm-hmm. working actors and it wasn't beneath them to do this like what feels like a student film mm-hmm. you know um, to at least come and put a day in. But Elijah yeah. Cook Jr. is in this, and he is the town drunk giving like the lore of the um the Dark Stranger. Mm-hmm. What so what is the story? What happened a hundred years ago? Right. I have to get past him talking about the chickens and being born on a farm because that's how he starts. Yeah, he remembers <laughs> yeah. his own birth, right? My Apparently. mother reached down between her legs and pulled out me as a bloody mess and it's really gross. Um, <laughs> I, I'm glad I don't remember my own birth. I'm just well, going to say that most people like, are glad for that. Yeah. I, but like, have you noticed that's kind of like a flex in like movies? Sometimes people say that like, there was another movie and I don't remember what it was where some kid said that he remembered his own birth. Was it the I'm, butterfly effect? Probably. <laughs> yes. Um, but like, why would you want to? remember that you wouldn't yeah, yeah. No, like it's not horrifying if, if you if you're a person that can remember that just keep that information to yourself because nobody wants to hear it also I you're imagining it yeah there was <laughs> some uh, uh um scientific uh, uh, research on this or something that i read so i'm hoping it's not just me talking out my ass but the idea of a drug acid trip right is the intensity that kind of happens that peaks Right. And then dissipates is actually somehow related to you remembering being born. Huh. That sounds like something someone on acid came up with. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Because (laughs) (laughs) I mean, here's the thing with psychedelics is everything feels like a religious experience. Yeah. So if you even have any sort of vague uh, feeling like you're experiencing that, I can see how you could convince yourself of that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's very easy to convince yourself of anything when you're on psychedelics. So were the people who wrote this movie on psychedelics? No, because it would be more interesting if it was. (laughs) And it it would have more visual appeal to what is the drug that we think they were taking when they wrote this movie? Hmm. I was going to go with marijuana. Is yeah. a stoned movie? It does, because it has that lazy energy. It does so. have yeah. that lazy... Yeah. And everything I think they thought when they were writing it down, it was all symbols and it was very deep. Uh-huh. And it, it means something more. Yeah, I what, think you're right about that. Yeah. Um, it, it, yeah. It's like that episode of Family Guy when Lois and Peter are a folk singing uh, duo and they think they're amazing and then it's just because they're stoned. It shows them when yeah, they're yeah. when they're actually singing yeah. like they just sound ridiculous. Yeah, it's the same effect. I think yeah. so. I think that actually kind of kind of, that like lays over all these movies from this era that we're talking yeah. about. And it feels like they were all written when everybody was really high. <laughs> like, oh, this and they're is like, brilliant! This is this like, genius. Yeah. yeah. Um. So these three travelers, right? Who they have the a meet weird. It's very uncomfortable. Very. Um. But then they end up kind of just freeloading in her house. Right. Uh, apparently, because she goes looking, she, apparently the people at the gallery tell her where to find these people that were also looking for her dad. She shows up. 
they're in the middle of listening to a weird homeless dude tell stories about his own birth. And, um, Oh, and what, what actually happened? We never, I guess told the folks at home that what is the hundred year story? Right. So all, uh, is based around the blood moon that a dark stranger shows up to town. In this case, it was like in the middle of the wilderness, you know, before it was all developed. So it's like a trapper came across him or a hunter or whatever came across this dark stranger. Um, And in talking to the dark stranger, the hunter finds out that he had spent time with the Donner Party. Mm -hmm. and That's how he came to the side of the Rockies. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. And he had experienced um, eating human flesh. Okay. Um, He... He walks through the fire and like attacks him, but he is like animalistic when he attacks him. And they make cat sounds. They make cat sounds. They wait, unexplained. Uh, but like strange. Oh, yeah. Why do they make cat sounds when they're always saying, "Oh, it's just wild dogs. It's just wild dogs." Like is yeah, they keep saying wild dogs, and then it sounds, it like, sounds the like fucking cat. MGM yeah. lion. Like yeah. what are you doing? Right. Pick, pick a side. Exactly. Like at least have some cohesiveness with yeah. your details here. I mean, I guess they just wanted to sound like a beast right. in general, but it but sounds like cats. Yeah, it goes back and forth, and yeah. it's very strange. But have we ever gotten a real deal like Downer Party movie? I would love one. I think they're they're out there, but they're but not, like a, not like, like a, a good one, major like not one. a TV I don't think made so. for TV yeah. movie. Like give me like, like like the Revenant, but the Donner Party. The Revenant. Right, I yeah. was gonna say the Hateful yeah. Eight, but like yeah, the Revenant. Give me yeah, yeah like a prestige. Give, give me yeah. like eight of the like most famous people right now to be well, in like a Donner yeah. Party. We movie. did have uh, alive the story of the the plane of soccer players. The soccer players, players yeah. yeah. That's right. We yeah. did have Ethan Hawke was he in that one? Am I right? I never saw that. Yeah. Shit, maybe I need to watch that. <laughs> um so but I, I guess this is like the the issue that I, I had <clears throat> was that I guess I you know there was there was some menace to these uh three people, right? Mm-hmm. I thought. Because they yeah. just kind of show up and they're like, We're just gonna stay at your house. And she's like uncomfortable with them being there, right? Mm-hmm. She's like, I'm on a mission to find my dad, and that's like all I want to yeah, do. Yeah, but they're like this. The homeless guy was found dead, and now no one will take us in. We need a place to stay. Yeah, so you're like, did they kill the homeless guy after she spoke with him? Because he right. warns her, like, when you find your pappy, you're going to have to light him on fire. <laughs> you know, he's been taken over by the, I don't know, your daddy, I think. <laughs> but he's been taken over by the evil of this town. Yeah. You can't bury him. You got to burn him. Yeah. Um, Because I think the the, the stranger is supposed to return on the on a, a new blood yep. moon. That's happening now, apparently. Mm-hmm. And so his influence is corrupting the town. Uh, the townspeople, when we do see them, because mostly this town appears as like a deserted town. Right. But they meet out on the beach and yeah. light fires as they are waiting, watching the moon and waiting for this guy to come back mm-hmm. out of the, the water. Mm-hmm. This is very H.P. Lovecraft. For sure. But this right? makes you think you're going to see some cool ritual, maybe satanic yeah. shit. Yeah. This is this is it. This is the <laughs> this is the quote unquote ritual is standing there and staring. Did you get a lot of there's this movie employs uh, probably because it is a low budget, but there's a lot of scenes where where characters are telling you about the big action scene that happened. Right. Mm -hmm. We spend a lot of our time in the house and just in kind of these quiet dialogue scenes. But all the folks are telling us about like I was chased down the road by a bunch of, you know, whatever. And then somebody kind of like that scene in Night of the Living Dead where um, Ben explains, you know, that he was being chased on the truck. And you see that in your head, but that didn't actually happen in the movie. Yeah. But that's kind of what this movie's trying to do Mm -hmm. is like build another movie in your mind other than what you're actually watching. Pretty much, yeah. Um, but it turns out, and I said, this is kind of why I had a, an issue with it. It took me a little while to figure out like, oh, Tom and his two ladies, they're like the normies in this movie that are our right. protagonists. And then I saw at the end, it was like, Michael Greer was the lead character. And I'm like, I thought Marianna Hill was the lead. Yeah. No, it's actually, he's the star of the movie. Yes. <laughs> And so it's actually about him and his, you know, trying to marshal these women around him, keep them safe from, even though he put, he brought them mm-hmm. into harm's way. Mm-hmm. It's very Hitchcock, isn't it? 
Yeah, but it, it doesn't necessarily even work that way. Right. You know, when you're watching it, I, I didn't get that impression. So tell me about, so so she goes to the house. Tell me about the house. Because it's. This is, this is like the big set piece of this show or this movie, whatever. Um, it's a cool house. <laughs> it's like. It is a cool house. It's like almost kind of castle esque, mm-hmm. but it's like a painter's studio on the beach. And it's it's just really cool. Like there's murals everywhere and all these different styles of art and it's very there's like a big round bag. Yeah. There's there's, like there's a big round bag with lots of like satin pillows and stuff, but then there's also like a, like a suspended bed. Okay, we gotta talk about studio. this bed because we spent a lot of time talking about this bed when we were watching it. Because this bed is like a supporting character. In the yeah, movie. Like, it's it, featured it really a lot. Is. It's featured a it lot. Really Although no sex on the bed. No, no sex on the bed. Which yeah. I, I, given the design of this bed, I would have liked to see it. You know, I no, I kept thinking about. It. I'm like, how? Because it's like a sex wing and a bed yeah. in one. It's because like, how would it? Yeah, it's like this big white wood plank. It looks like. That like very modern looking, yeah. With these white chains suspending it from the ceiling, but it's like tight enough that it just sways slightly. Yeah. So it's the it's the upgraded version of a waterbed, basically. Because and the, and the funny yeah. thing is, is that like it is a it is a platform and it's a big platform that like it's, it's big, huge. It's yeah. bigger than the mattress. Yeah. So there's like there's like a border around it, and I and there's different things that like, like house plants appear on it. Like yeah. at one point there's a record player on it. There's Which like, I was curious. How is the power getting? To yeah. Right yeah. Over? Like the, pl- <laughs> the plants kept moving. There'd be different plants right. on it. Yeah. And I was like, but this, this room like also like thing. only has three walls and faces like a balcony that overlooks the ocean. So yeah. you can lay and on this big swing fireplace. bed and look at the, and look at the ocean. It's yeah. Big ass fireplace. Hell this yeah. house is so cool. Yeah. yeah. And the murals are a lot of like forced perspective. Yeah. Um, humanoid character. Mm-hmm. You know, they're people, but they're represented in a way that's like not entirely defined. If that yeah. makes sense. And I, I, I don't think there were supposed to be anyone, but I'm pretty sure one of them may have been styled after Nixon and one of them after Humphrey Bogart. Oh, okay. Because they looked very similar. Yeah. yeah. I was like, I don't think they wanted them to look exactly like it, but I feel like that was kind of their the reference point for that. I mean, it does add a significant amount to the movie, the production design of this interior house. You know, it's yeah. very colorful. Um, yeah, like, yeah, like, uh, technically speaking, like, this movie has a lot of flaws, but visually, there's a lot of really cool stuff in this movie. Yeah, from the lighting yeah. work inside yeah. there and, you know, everything. It's like, it has a distinct, you know, I mean, it, it's very 70s, but it has a distinct, like, visual look to it yeah uh, as far we're, i guess i'm less in the in the photography more in the production design I mean, some of the photography but yeah no it's but yeah there's there's definitely a vision yeah. for this movie and it comes through pretty obvious but like it's it's a cool vibe this movie's a vibe yeah it's definitely a vibe <laughs> um so the main gist of the movie then is going to have find uh, these characters kind of well no okay right so I now so now each character has to be uh, or has to basically fall victim to the cult or people or whatever the whatever they are because we don't know what they are because that's what's going on right yeah, we they, see a lot of like uh, I guess they're well dressed folks they're all in suits and yeah. dresses I don't and- know if this is true but I saw something that said that it was. Um, a lot of the extras in this movie were played by unemployed NASA employees. Because of where they shot it? I, huh. That's what I read. Okay. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah. But sure, why not? I'll believe it. <laughs> I think it's a, if it's it's a harm in believing if it. If it's true, it's fun. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But they have, I mean, I guess you're, you're also setting up that kind of like, um, you know, anti-establishment. Uh, vibe with the you know the the well dressed people going after the three the four hippies in town right mm-hmm. it's that the, the man or the authority mm-hmm. or something like that mm-hmm. um and they're all ghouls they bleed from the eyes and that's, the ears that's how you know the that mouth. they're affected by the curse yeah. right we're told uh, through the voiceover because apparently her father has gone through this he's missing right but he left his, his uh, diary and mm-hmm. so in his diary he's explaining basically the steps that he's going through he doesn't feel pain anymore right uh he's he, he see well he's seeing all these creatures he's, that can't be real but he's having like visions aside from that and yeah yeah so he's like losing his mind mm-hmm. then he loses his faculties he starts mm-hmm. uh bleeding at one point he like rips his own finger off yeah he doesn't even feel it doesn't feel yeah. it yeah um 
so we're like, okay, this is foreshadowing. We're setting up somebody's eventual transformation yeah. into uh, this, which we assume is going to be one of our main characters. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also, I felt uh, the the subplot, which never I thought resolved itself, was the sexual tension between like Tom has two women, and now here's the the third that you know, yeah. and the other women kind of feel this, uh, you know, like they're now second banana to. Yeah. his latest conquest and there is this swinging bed and it never kind of I know there's a big satin covered bed and a swinging bed and there's three women to the one dude you think there's going to be some decent sex in this movie or you know does the seduction pay off because it seems like he's trying to seduce her like the entire way through the movie and mm-hmm. you're like well where is this going mm-hmm. and it turns out it goes nowhere yeah. <laughs> I mean yeah Although, Logically speaking, I get it. Right. Because what was his opening line? It was pretty good. Uh, oh, his zipper was stuck. <laughs> I need you to help me with something. Yeah, my zipper's stuck. Can you help me? But it was like his <laughs> vest zipper. Yeah. Which like, I was like, this is a new pickup line. I I don't hate it, but I also am like, wow, you're not, you're just cutting right to the chase on this one. But then, yeah. It tur- and so you think it, it's going to be the pants zipper. No, it is. He's wearing a vest and he wants the side of it on one yeah. side. Unzipped. Yeah, this vest consists of buttons in the front and a zipper on each side. side. Yes. Yeah. So what does Was it come off over his thing? head? I've never seen that. <laughs> does it go on like a I like a it bib? Goes on, you just instead of zipping it down the front, you zip it down the side. But it had a zipper on each side, I thought. It had a zipper on each side and buttons. Yeah, Very, so it goes on like a smock. Weird. And you fucking... <laughs> zip it up on each side. But like also, dude, you can unzip that yourself. This is a weak ass pickup line. Like yeah. but yeah. also he she unzips it and he doesn't take it off. Well so. you don't leave a man unzipped right. and you know whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um and then they just like embrace. Yeah. yeah. Like they don't even kiss. Yeah. I know. And then he's like, and it's like he, he's respectful. Right there. He's like, You're tired. I'm tired too. We're both tired. Good yeah. <laughs> and so you're like, ooh, but later. Tension. Right. Yeah. Um, but the other two girls, they're not having this. Uh, The first girl, Anita Ford, she's like, I'm out of here. And so she hikes out into the night on her own Mm -hmm. and gets a ride with the uh, albino. The albino from the beginning, yeah. Who it turns out has been catching rats and eats them. (laughs) Oh, got one here. I'll eat it. (laughs) Would you like one? I have more. She's like, no. Jumps out of there. (laughs) There's a bunch of people in the back of the the truck. All staring up at the moon. Very weird. Very weird. This is a very creepy scene. And she's left off in town, which is deserted, and she sees someone, and she follows her to a Ralph's grocery store. It's the same girl from the beginning of the movie, isn't it? Is it? I think so. Okay. The little girl. Okay. Who lured yeah. Walter Hill to his death. Mm-hmm. And so in the Ralph's grocery store. Yeah, which is open for some reason. I don't know why it's open at like 12 at night. but Where we ended up like a lot of this movie. Sorry, my interest was looking at all the prices. And stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah. And, 100%. We yeah. want to know yeah. how much we're doing yeah. uh, inflation calculators <laughs> yeah. while we were watching this. It was, it was a sweater for two ninety nine dollars at Ralph's. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when they go to the movies, the popcorn is fifty cents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But Amazing. you figured out like the the two fifty sweater was actually how much? A twenty one dollar sweater, $21. which is still a really good deal. So yeah. it was a good deal. <laughs> but she finds a bunch of yeah. people uh, just snacking in and the. I feel like this is a pretty iconic scene. If you've heard anything about this movie, you've probably seen a, a clip of this scene. I think this is yeah. Yeah. So th- what are they doing? They're eating at it's the. A, it's a bunch of people standing around the the meat, uh, like. The butcher counter. Yeah, the butcher counter. Yeah, thank you. And just chowing down on raw meat. And we're like, ew, what the? <laughs> and then they gross. notice that she's there and pursue her and, of course, getting up on her. And then very George Romero like descend upon her and mm-hmm. apparently rip her apart and eat her. Mm-hmm. Cannibals. Yeah. Because of the, the dark stranger. Yeah. Right? This is his new religion, cannibalism. I'm mm-hmm. not entirely sure what's going on there. There yeah, was talk I'm- of old gods coming back because we're in a faithless time and like mm-hmm. you know now it'll turn to the old gods that's when he'll reappear mm-hmm. the messiah of evil mm-hmm. okay don't expect that <laughs> from this movie though um so the other girl the younger one yeah. she eventually you know has enough of this like you're waiting to you know yeah because he's like, he's like hey why don't you take the car and go to the movies she's like i get to drive the car and go to the movies and then she realizes that he's just trying to get rid of her mm-hmm. and all the joy leaves her face mm-hmm. <laughs> You know, you still get to go to the movies, yeah, though. You go to so. the movies, yeah. yeah, and drive a sweet car, <laughs> right? Have yeah, fun. I know, right? Yes. I mean, this is not a bad, yeah. bad gig. Talk what does she man. go to see? 
Kiss tomorrow goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> but that's but then the movie is what something gone it's something with the West. Gone right? with the West. Gone oh, that West? was the trailer before the movie. Okay. It was, oh, okay. Okay. the previews. Yeah. Okay. It's a Western. Uh, yeah. We're with Sammy watching. Davis Jr. Yeah. Yeah. The um so this is a, the theater when she arrives is basically deserted. It doesn't look unlike modern movie theaters. Right. But yeah. but there was something that stuck out to us, which we had a big discussion about. Is there is one guy sitting up in the front row. Of this movie theater, even though this, most of the seats are open. Yeah. Listeners, when was the last time you had to sit in the front row or the second row because the theater was so packed? I think the last time that happened to me was like a Star Wars movie. Probably. Well, and, and I want to know, I wanna know yeah. if there's any of you crazies out there that like the front row. Right. Are you that person? Is there that person anymore? It's really bad in IMAX. That's, oh, that's God. hell. Yeah. yeah. You just want the movie to wash over you. Yeah. You want the full experience. Front yeah. row. I re- yeah, you are only used to be in the front row if you got trapped there. There was nowhere else to right. go. I think when I saw Oppenheimer, it was pretty much packed, and there was people in the front row, and I was like, oh, my God. Yeah, wow, that was that weird. Yeah. sucks. Mm-hmm. Although there is the story of all the uh, acid heads in 1968 that would go and lay down in the front row and oh, watch yeah. 2001 A Space Odyssey, so they, they I mean, would start <laughs> tripping by the time they got to the Stargate sequence. I mean, I get that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, so, sh- so she's in the in the movie theater, mm-hmm. and uh, slowly it fills in behind her with all of the denizens yeah. of Point Dune, and then they they respectfully wait until the movie's over to attack her, but she can't get out. <laughs> and the doors are locked. Do they wait for the movie to be? Yeah, over? the movie ends. The lights come up, and then they all attack her. They didn't do anything before that, and you're like, we're waiting for something. There's so much to footage of people coming in one by one through these doors and sitting yeah. down in the movie theater. I it goes like, on for so yeah. long. I like the idea of this scene, mm-hmm. but it does go on for too long. Yep. It's like, okay, we get what you're doing. Especially because we don't need to see everybody walk in. You show one person walking in, you cut to a close-up of her, you cut to a wide shot, and there's like five more people. Cut to a close-up of her, cut to another wide shot, there's ten people. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like That's how Alfred Hitchcock would do it, right? Yeah. Like that scene in the birds when the crows yes. land and they yeah. pan out and you see there's like hundreds yeah. of them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's how you do that, you know? Yeah, the shock that yes. there's more. Yeah. But we watch them all file in, <clears throat> and eventually they attack her and apparently eat her alive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So now we're down to two characters left in the movie. At mm-hmm. some point, there is like a whole thing with like the police find a body that is supposed to be her father, and they lead her down to the beach yeah. where he was working on a art installation that collapsed that on, him. on him. And she's like, I don't know why they lied to me. Those weren't his hands. So it's not her father. She's right. Her father shows up eventually. But he has been taken over Mm -hmm. by the thing. Now, his whole motivation for her, right, appearing at this point in the movie, is, I told you not to come here, but since you did, I want you to leave here and tell everyone in the outside world what is happening Mm -hmm. in Point Dune, because Mm -hmm. they're going to come from the sea and then travel down the coast and invade the cities. Mm-hmm. Right, so that's yeah. what's, uh, that's the ultimate plan here. That's going to happen. Yeah, this you shouldn't have come, but since you're movie. here, you know, spread the word. <laughs> then he attacks her. Well, like you do. Yeah. And then there's a big fight with paint. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And turpentine. Yep. Yeah. Um. And it's not just like her pushing him into paint. It's like him going nuts and just throwing paint around and putting paint on himself and his face. Yeah. On his face. Um, Throwing it all over the wall. Yeah, it's yeah. more or less just him having a fit and yeah. putting paint on himself. Yeah. Yep. I know a lot of people that would do this as a performance piece. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Mm-hmm. But see, this also kind of leads me to, because uh, when you said before that the uh, the inclusion of the blind art dealer mm-hmm. was kind of a comment on art, well, not art criticism, but... Like the, the art, art scene. Art the hierarchy. Art, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, so I see what you're saying. So because yeah. the movie, so they're not criticizing that like the art itself is like a blind person could sell it. It's more that the people who are in charge of art don't know anything about what they have because the movie makers are trying to make an art film, right? right. I mean, like that that is the whole mm-hmm. thing. So that would right. be contradictory if they were right because if you go to like these like snooty galleries like they show in this movie it's all like the beach paintings and which don't get me wrong you know beach there's painting a can place be good. for them yeah. yeah beach painting can be good but it's all like the very st- like it's like thomas kincaid kind of yeah, stuff yeah. you know like it's gonna be hotel art hotel yeah. art you know mm-hmm. 
and but this stuff sells for crazy amounts of money and that's the commentary that Mm -hmm. something unique and original is not gonna sell but you're gonna buy a lighthouse Mm -hmm. for thousands of dollars and a blind and a blind person could sell Right, so mm-hmm. don't watch the blockbusters. Watch the indie movies yeah. like Messiah Pretty much. of Evil, yeah. which are actually real movies. We were actually just saying something similar to that before we started recording. <laughs> we really were, yeah. <laughs> we were talking about not seeing remakes or sequels in theaters yeah. to yeah. stop perpetuating them, yeah. I mean, so yeah. I guess it's a, it's, it's a good thing that they're out there making their individual art, even though yes. it might be impenetrable to try and determine what's actually going on. What does this movie say about... I mean, if it's a movie that seems to be concerned so much about art, mm-hmm. the there's characters who are artists mm-hmm. and, you know, collectors, mm-hmm. supposedly, of uh, art. Like, what is the uh, general... I mean, you're, I, th- I think you're right in thinking that this movie may have been created by people who are kind of hippies, because I think they're very much talking about the the art itself, the artist, the, the spirit behind the art, the, the heart behind it you know um so I, th- I think it's a commentary on originality i think is what it's but is it is it saying that well it's not saying that the art um creates a like does the communicable disease of evil no no because he he's missing he the artist became part of the against his will mm-hmm. became part of it and so he wants yeah. someone who's outside of that to go like warn everybody I mean I, coming so I'm like I'm missing no I I, I I think there is a lot of I think there's a lot of symbolism here I think they're saying like you uh, the if you conform you're you're gonna be part of the problem so you're just going to fall in with the rest of the, mm-hmm. the zombies okay but if you if you go out there and like put out your original art and your original thoughts and everything then you're going against that. I think that's the symbolism they were going for here. Mm-hmm. Like it's a counterculture. It's trying yeah. to be a counterculture. Mm-hmm. It is. Movie, yeah. It feels very appropriate for the time. So For sure. But yeah. I yeah. just don't know that it fully delivers it as clearly as that's it, what yeah. I'm saying. Yeah. I was like, I see what I think they're trying to do. Right. I don't think it was communicated as well as they wanted. Right. But, right. And isn't I never finished it because I couldn't get into it, but isn't that kind of what Velvet Buzzsaw was going for, right? Yes. But in yeah. a much more in your face way. Very much. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I didn't care for that movie. I mean, I never finished it, but it was, it wasn't my favorite. No, no, favorite. it's too bad. There was well, potential there. I'm still trying to like even unpack the imagery that we see at the end of this movie. Uh, Tom is killed by, cause eventually the, the ghouls invade the house. Right. They, they invade tear the it house. Apart and they come yeah. in there and they, they come get, through the windows, the skylight, just, they ruin the, beautiful skylight oh, they all jump gorgeous. one at a time through the skylight and let out their tiger scream which is just like the, i do like the imagery of the silhouettes through the skylight i yeah. love it's cool yeah. but yeah. they make it comical by the way they handle it i agree like, yeah. yeah they kind of take the wind out of their sails but anytime they do have scary imagery in this i movie, agree it's... yeah and eventually dad is lit on fire and he's burned yeah um that was before she... tom even came back yeah that's but, right yeah. And, and she is bleeding from the eyes and is poking herself with needles right. and she's... is not feeling Anything, so she's, she's having all of the the same side effects that her dad was having right yeah so tom comes back she stabs him then apparently she's apologized and so he's like <laughs> we got to get out of here and so they wander down the beach mm-hmm. but the 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 crazy people are still following them this is the they're branching yeah. out right yeah they've come down to the beach to prepare for the moon watching yeah and now we're caught, you know, in that mm-hmm. Tom is killed. Yeah. So there's nowhere to go because they're surrounded. So they go to the sea. They start kind of like swimming to try to get out to a boat. Oh, well, that's right. He away. drowns. He drowns. Yeah. Because they're, they're swimming and she turns and he's gone. Yeah. And then yeah. there's a scene where she goes underwater, but the narration is like, but they didn't let me drown. This is where they're making the movie up as they go. Yep. And uh, <laughs> instead they brought me to the rocks and they put me in a. And a gown. And the dark stranger did appear. And, and gave we her see this. Bonnie Tyler hair. Right. Her hair was huge all of a sudden. It, because it seems like it's from a different, like they shot it some other time later or this was part of a bigger scene. So my understanding is that there was, there was the, the, uh, the scenes of the Messiah that gotcha. we did get that. And there's a part, um, when we're hearing the story about the dark stranger coming and I was like, that looks like Tom. It was. That was that was supposed to be. Like a resurrected Tom? 
Because he couldn't have been the dark stranger the whole time. He was supposed to be. Because it doesn't make any sense. Which is why it was cut. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, Tom was supposed to be the dark stranger. This is my understanding. I don't, Returning to the yeah. town after. Yeah. But he it doesn't was, make any sense. Because of, yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> so with that subplot cut out, yeah. the implication is that she's in a bridal. And the dark stranger now. was supposed to be the son of Satan. Okay. So. And, she, and, yeah. and I assume then we were supposed to get some kind of like the dark mate. Right. And the birth of the Antichrist or the Anti-Cthulhu or whatever. <sighs> I think maybe they just didn't know where they're going with it. So they yeah. delete that. They use voiceover that all of a sudden she's in a garden setting and she's painting. I think that's significant, yeah. right? She's become the painter that her mm-hmm. dad and mm-hmm. she's like, but they let me go with the idea that I was going to be the one who was supposed to tell the story. But they knew that no one would believe me. And so she's in a mental hospital. Mm-hmm painting we never get to see what she's painting because right, that was that's, that's I think, it really bugs me that should be like that's what you're supposed to like the that end of the movie end, no yeah, yeah. <laughs> that should be she's painting the dark stranger and it's tom yeah, yeah. That's the big reveal. exactly yeah. that, that's what it should have been and then you pull out and her room's just covered with different paintings of him yeah. and the dark stranger like yeah. like like that like, would have brought it all together and yeah. it would have been like Good stuff. Like, you know like how in Rob Zombie's Halloween, you see Michael Myers in his cell and they're like at, at the sanitarium and like his walls covered in the masks mm-hmm. he's been making like yeah. like that. And yeah. like, this is her like hyper focus obsession is like yeah. revealing this information. If that had been yeah. the end of this movie, I would have been like, bravo. Right. That's solid. But instead we're treated to a rapid fire orgy of violence where the movie basically recuts a trailer of all the Yeah, it just deaths. recaps the movie. Recaps the movie. That's yeah. It. All the gory deaths of the movie. And then... Uh, it it really cheaps out at the end because it replays the first shot of the movie, which is her wandering down the uh in the, the right. sanitarium hallway, uh, telling us basically that like the dark strangers out there, yeah. the his legions have now gone into the cities and they're coming for you. Yep. And it's very apocalyptic. But no one will listen. No one will hear you scream. Yep. The end. The end. That's okay. It. All right. Well, I guess we're going to we're going to let you folks know what our thoughts are on this movie and whether or not you should watch it real quick. What do you think the most expensive purchase for this movie was? That bed, the swinging bed. <laughs> what do you Actually, think? Actually, no. Well, now I'll go with it. Most ben? expensive purchase. Yeah. Now, obviously, they rented a lot of things. Right. And you, but purchase. What do you think the most expensive purchase was? I couldn't even tell you. I'm trying to think. I mean, obviously, they had I'm, I'm assuming the, the house was not. A location it was a set mm-hmm. i don't know what was the most expensive tom suit oh really <laughs> really <laughs> yeah. so that That's was funny. a found location yeah. that they just <laughs> got into a house and yeah okay so they were able to yeah to go it was there. a nice suit even though it had a ridiculous dick print but yeah it was a good suit no that's right. We missed the whole. He's accosted on the streets and yeah. all this other stuff, mm-hmm. and chasing zombie like chasing the police officer. One of them. There's two of them just shooting at the zombies at one point as they're getting overrun. And then one of them turns into a zombie mm-hmm. and kills the other one. Um, Apparently there were real cops that weren't paid for this. Oh, really? And they, this is a rumor, but they pulled over Michael Greer and wouldn't let him go until they got paid for the, yeah. for the movie. <laughs> Good. Well, that's how you do it. Yeah. Um, all right. So we will go around the table, tell you what we thought of tonight's movie, Messiah of Evil. But first, we're going to hear from you. Because we're going to read some of your mail. And in order to do that, we're going to have to summon our mailman, Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. Has he been to the point the Messiah of evil? He's a Messiah. We just don't know what of. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's nice to be a Messiah of something, I guess, right? Yeah. I think only he thinks. Damn. I think Igor's just throwing that. the mail around over here. Just yeah, dropping it left and right. Whipping wow. it at us tonight. He claims he's a Messiah. I think only he believes that, though. Yeah. Well, we should let the good folks at home know how they can participate in this interactive portion of our show by following along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Saturday Night Freak Show. Or X. At Sat Freak Show. Or by email. Saturday Night Freak Show, Yahoo.com. Or on Instagram and threads at Saturday Night Freak Show. About tonight's movie, The Messiah of Evil, Attack of the 20th Century, writes in and says it's got two of the creepiest, memorable deaths in 70s horror, the grocery store scene and the movie theater scene. Both are masterfully executed. 
Okay. I, I think they're cool. All right. I think it leaves you wanting more. The last week we watched a movie called The Butterfly Effect. Travis Legler writes in and says, I was completely, oh, so we're going to spoil the ending, the oh, multiple yeah. endings of The Butterfly Effect. So you want to skip ahead about, I don't know, a minute and a half here. But um, Travis Legler says, I was completely in sync and having the same reaction in real time as Holly with the description of the ending of this movie. I've only known the death in the womb ending. Which is- as much as I love viewing the making of documentaries, deleted scenes, trailers for movies, this is one I never knew had a different ending. And I'm not really sure there was a good way to end this movie that wasn't on a downer note. That's right, because we said most of you who saw the butterfly effect apparently saw it on home video in the director's cut, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, which has a different ending than the theatrical version, which is the one that's on the... Yeah. Uh, the streaming services now. They've got the original theatrical back. Yep. So I didn't see that ending coming. <laughs> How many endings does this, that movie have? I think we established in the week since. Or was it Michaela four? Four. Yes. Because at least there's four different IMDb listings for the alternate ending. <laughs> and they have names like the sappy ending, the fucked up ending. Like that. Like, <laughs> they each have like the butterfly effect alternate ending colon and then a tie. I couldn't believe it. It's I couldn't it's believe it. It's literally the end of Wayne's World. Yeah. Now it's a super happy ending. Yeah, exactly. Where you could get one of the... But I did notice on the IMDb, the Death in the Wound ending got the highest rating. It is a... It is the best one for how ridiculous for, that movie yeah, is. It's the most appropriate for that movie. That movie's so stupid and so ridiculous. You might as well end it on a ridiculous note like yeah. that. You know? I agree. Well, Joey Blythe says, I watched the original movie in theaters, and then later on, when it came on demand, I told my mom it was pretty good and she should watch it. I started it not realizing I played the extended alternate ending and got to the scene where the mom is talking about almost losing him in the womb, and I thought, I don't remember this. Then we got to the scene where he kills himself with his own umbilical cord. (laughs) Holy shit, that was bleak. Yeah, yeah. I mean... The thing is, even if you go with like the quote unquote happy ending, like the one we watched, does it really matter when the whole movie was so fucking bleak no, to begin it doesn't with? Matter. Like, so you might as well double doesn't down matter. on it, right? There should definitely be a trigger warning for that alternate ending, though. Yeah. And well, Michael Whitaker, so I'm not entirely sure which ending he's speaking of here. Mm-hmm. So I'll read his uh, okay. his, his message. He says, "I actually give credit to the filmmakers for picking a less downer ending." that still fundamentally accomplished the same conclusion as the original one. You have to admit it's the same outcome. Uh, I think he's talking about the one we watched because I think so they too. just, they were never in each other's lives. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, okay. So the names of the endings are the happy sappy ending, the stalker ending, which what is that one? Is that's that where a different he follows one? her. Okay. That, yeah. That's, but then what's the happy one? The happy sappy is the one we the, saw where he did. They just keep walking. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then director's cut ending and then deleted ending. Which we don't know what the deleted so, ending is. Yeah. The director's cut is the womb. The womb. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, there you go. Uh, the <laughs> week before, we watched a movie called The Prophecy, and Richard Kratzer says, because we posted some photos um, from the movie, there's a scene with Viggo Mortensen as uh, Lucifer and the little goblin he's got with him. Remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. they're sitting there. And Richard Kratz is a demon, says, uh, not a goblin. Okay. Colin. <laughs> <laughs> he says, Lucifer's friend is how I imagine Igor looks on a Saturday night when he goes out stepping. <laughs> yep. That, yes. That's, that's yes. accurate. Yeah. <laughs> He's just bobbing back yep. and forth. <sighs> yep. Very true. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all, each of you, for writing in. We really appreciate it. Uh, now we're going to go around the table, tell you what Colin. we thought of. Oh, man. What did you think? Sorry, there's only two, there's only two of us. So, uh, Messiah of Evil. I feel like I'm somehow going to be hypocritical by not uh, recommending this movie because uh, there are several others from this era with a similar vibe mm-hmm. that make about it as much sense that I do like. So then you're like, okay, well, then you have to explain why you didn't like this one if you're going to go and recommend some of those other ones. Um, I think the problem that I have is that it just feels so disjointed and Mm -hmm. completely made up that it doesn't make a lick of sense, uh, even, you know, when you're sitting here trying to work it out after the fact. So then, right, if you're like, okay, it doesn't make any sense, but it wasn't supposed to make sense, Colin. It's supposed to be 
uh, atmospheric mood thing. It's supposed to feel like a nightmare that you can't wake up from. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that usually seems to be like a fallback position mm -hmm. for a lot of filmmakers when they can't like they, they, they just, you know, like they don't do the hard work to figure out like how, how mm -hmm. a logical story works out mm -hmm. or, you know, or don't um, put in the effort to make their symbols uh, understandable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I get like you put symbols in there so people who recognize this stuff will go like, oh, that right. means this and that means that. So somebody somewhere is going to explain it to me. Yeah, I'm sure. They're, oh, it's all about this. So either I'm dense. I don't think that it's there. I think that it's a movie that it feels like they got halfway through it. It feels like they had problems making it. It feels like and credit to the writers for making up a lot of it in the dialogue or in the voiceover mm -hmm. to have a movie to eventually release to drive-ins and whatever in 1974. So, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think, yeah, <laughs> there's not enough there. Like all the, 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 the set pieces kind of leave you wanting. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, it feels some derivative in a lot of ways of other stuff that you've seen or read. So I think I'm going to pass on the Messiah of evil. Um, I'm, I'm going to pass on the Messiah of evil. Uh, Michaela, <laughs> what did you think? Uh, well, Colin and I, I, I don't know if I can't remember if I mentioned it. Colin and I had seen this previously because we watched it when the Elvira thing uh, happened. And when Holly, when you picked this, Colin and I kind of exchanged a look because I remember you and I talking about it and be like, I don't get it. I don't get the hype around this movie because like when the, when Elvira did it, everyone was like, fuck yeah, Messiah of Evil. There was so much, the fandom came out hard for this oh, movie. Yeah. And I think we did it a disservice because I know I watched um, the Elvira in order. Messiah of the Evil was the last one. And coming off of City of the Dead and then going into Messiah of Evil is a big disservice to that movie. So, but I think I my expectations were totally in the wrong place the first time I watched it because based on the title and based on it coming after city of the dead, I thought it was going to be a Satanist movie mm -hmm. and it's not. And that's fine. That's not the movie's fault, but that's definitely what I thought it was going to be. Um, so I was disappointed the first time I saw it and I had a really hard time engaging with it. The first time I saw it, I remember I kept falling asleep and I was just like, I was bored by it. And this time I enjoyed it more, more definitely than I did last time. But I agree, Colin. I think it's a little too meandering and it's a little shoddily put together and it just, there's not enough meat on the bones here for mm -hmm. me. So I'm going to pass on it too. But I do like, I do like about the freak show in general is that uh, every week I come and I'm like, Colin, you seen this random movie from the sixties or seventies? And you usually have, and if you, <laughs> if you haven't, you, you usually have a good reason for why you haven't, you know? Um, but I just, I remember you and I felt like, we were the only people that didn't get it when Elvira yeah. covered it. <laughs> yeah. um, and so I'm glad people like it, but it's not for me. Mm -hmm. But I'm also like, I don't hate it. This is not the worst movie I've ever seen. I just don't have strong feelings either way about this movie, I feel yeah. like. Um, but uh, Holly, I see why you brought it. And I like, you know, it's always worth dissecting here. So, but I'm going to pass on it. But it's a little light pass. Whatever. Yeah. Holly, what'd you think? Yeah, no, I... I I totally agree with you. I had not seen this movie. I just saw bits of it online. I saw the trailers. I read a little bit about it. Um, and then I saw people raving about it as well. Um, but I completely agree with you. I think it's not a, it's not a horrendous movie. It's not offensive. I think visually there's some really beautiful things in it. Um, some of the shots are really cool. Some of the, uh, some of the the fashion and the art it's a lot of it's really cool i actually took a lot several pictures during i was like i'm gonna paint that i'm gonna paint that mm. um and that's kind of one of the reasons i brought it because i saw stylistically like what it looked like i'm like i want to watch this movie so that part i'm it didn't disappoint there was a lot of really beautiful imagery to it that i i really liked um but it's the 70s and there's a lot of movies that has really beautiful imagery that you could watch um mm -hmm. I like the vibe of this movie for mm -hmm. sure. Definitely. It's got a really cool vibe, um, but I think it's just misplaced. It's just they could have done so much more with it. I, like I, I, I read that 
there was more to like the Messiah part and like the, the dark stranger was actually going to be like the son of Satan. And I was like, OK, well, yes, <laughs> like those are the elements that this was missing. Right. Those are the things that would have made it really cool if it was like a satanic movie and mm-hmm. you had these things like that would have been really cool. And I thought we were going to get that because the the dark stranger, when we see the, the clips, like you can tell it's played by the same guy mm-hmm. that played Tom. I was like, OK, yes, I'm on board. It's going to be Tom. This is great. And it just doesn't play out like that. So it's disappointing. So I agree. I don't understand the hype behind this movie because it's it is a very slow movie. It's not exciting. Um, there's some cool moments. I, I like the grocery store scene. I like the theater scene, but it still falls short. It doesn't give you what you want. It's not a satisfying movie by any means. Um, so, yeah, although it's not terrible. I agree. It's a light pass. It is a good poster. It is, it is a really good poster. It is a really good poster. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool, cool stuff to look at in this movie. And I think the poster title is what got me. Like, seeing the poster and seeing the title, I was like, ooh, that's going to yeah. be yeah. badass. No, yeah. that's what sold yeah, me. When yeah. I picked this, I was like, oh, I need to check this movie yeah. out. Um, so, yeah, it's... I don't... <sighs> I'm not going to recommend it, but it wouldn't hurt to like turn it on in the background and maybe turn some music on with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like just kind of watch it in the background. If you're like an artistic person, it could be inspiring to you. It was to me. Um, but as a movie, you could probably pass. It's, you're not missing much. There are other movies from the 70s you should watch. Mm-hmm. I imagine a lot of people probably did have it on in the background and they were at the drive-in or whatever. It right. feels like it's yeah. one of those movies that like probably, you know, played on late night you know horror hosted shows right. or something like that and so people caught it it oh, does yeah. have like a i mean i think like a the drive-by kind of criticism of it is going to be like it was haunting or it was <laughs> atmospheric right they'll just throw those and it's like yes it is atmospheric yeah. but it's not enough there you that, go. That, that <laughs> atmosphere does not a movie make you know yeah, yeah like you gotta have a little more i would I, I just got a really great art book of Sofia Coppola, all of her movies, and it's a gorgeous book. And I was looking through um, the Marie Antoinette section. I'm like, that's a movie where there's very little plot, but atmospheric and like stylistically, it's so beautiful mm-hmm. that you don't need it. Some movies can be about the atmosphere. Yeah, you, you know? can you can do it. Yeah, but it falls short in this movie. Right. You know. Okay, all right. Well, I guess that's Messiah of Evil. Next week on the Saturday Night Freak Show, we're going to watch a movie that's chosen by... Michaela, what are we watching next week? We're going to watch a movie that traumatized a generation, Final Destination 2. <laughs> <laughs> no one could ever drive on Behind a highway a again. Yeah. Yeah. again. We all know why. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, the second Final Destination that we're, we've yeah. done on the show. Yes. All right, Final Destination 2. Coming up next week on the Saturday Night Freak Show. We hope you'll join us for that. And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark.